Hellions number 6 is chapter 18 in Marvel's Ten of Swords 22 part event, a simultaneously brutal and funny look at Marvel's misfits fully earning their Suicide Squad stripes as the team led by Mr. Sinister ventures into the hell of Araco. Today I'll answer, why did Mr. Sinister really want to go to Araco back when he half pitched this idea to the Quiet Council of Krakoa? Where do the Hellions go from here in what is a major issue for the team? Theories and predictions for what's to come next in X-Men and, of course, the Ten of Swords event as we rapidly approach the conclusion. Hey, everybody. I'm Dave Busing, founder and editor-in-chief of ComicBookHerald.com. You are listening to Kraken Krakoa number 119. If you like the Comic Book Herald YouTube channel or Kraken Krakoa, please consider liking, subscribing, sharing, and commenting here on the video with your thoughts and theories. You can find full X-Men and Ten of Swords reading overs on CBH.com. Spoilers for discussed comics will follow. Writer Zeb Wells, artist Carmen Carnero, Carnero, colors by David Curiel, and letters by Ariana Maher. Against all odds, Hellions has entered my shortlist for favorite comics of 2020. You can find the full list on Comic Book Herald. Most impressively cementing that standing during event tie-ins over the last couple issues, generally the bane of an ongoing series. That is seriously some unprecedented excellence. I was curious how Hellions would tie into Ten of Swords at this point because last we saw the team, the Fellowship was making their merry march through Otherworld to find and steal the Swords of Araco to force that team, the other side of the tournament, to forfeit. But as we've seen, the tournament is well underway, nearly reaching its endpoint, and meanwhile the Hellions are just getting to Araco. It's an appropriately comedic beat for a series that has never pretended to be anything else, and the rage the newly one-eyed Havoc feels towards Mr. Sinister for taking them on this useless trip is pretty delicious. As Tarn the Uncaring reveals, Sinister's real reasons for venturing into Araco are to obtain samples of Araco mutant genes for his collection. Sinister is that comics collector at a con who tells his friend group he saw David Tennant walking around near the very back of the floor, but really just wanted to see if any of the retailers there had any copies of Secret Wars number 8. Not that I know anything about that very specific example. It is interesting to consider what Sinister could do with Arakan DNA. Coming out of this, he will have the ability to clone Tarn and the Locust Vile, and who knows what else. There's a possibility now, too, that he could weave these Araco mutants into his Chimera projects, although again, to what end, I don't really know. I do feel like the effort he's making here puts a mild wrench in my theory that Ten of Swords ends with reuniting Krakoa and Araco into the one land, into Okara, because if that did happen, Sinister would more or less just have the whole of Araco mutants available to him. Then again, that would be another Hellion's appropriate turn that the poor Suicide Squad died for DNA he would have gotten anyway. Much like the X-Men's Krakoan Nation have met their analog counterparts on Araco, Tarn the Uncaring is a clear riff on Sinister himself, and the Locust Vile that we meet here, mutilated and mutated as they are, come to represent the cannon fodder of the Hellions. Hellions does at least deliver on Araco worldbuilding, even if it's intentionally disconnected from kind of the tournament and story of Ten of Swords at large. The ambition of Ten of Swords is that there's worldbuilding to be done for two literal separate worlds, Amenth and other world, and for my money there's simply not enough space to really do either quite enough. I kind of wind up just wanting more of each. So I appreciate that Hellions is able to tap that well and deliver a little bit here about some characters and what it's like in this world in Amenth with the Rocco mutants. The Locust Vile, for their part, they tear the Hellions apart. Havoc loses his hands, Nanny and Orphan Maker get demolished, Orphan Maker gets his arm pulled off, revealing very little, which was a little disappointing considering there's some mystery to what is actually inside his containment suit. I thought maybe we'd get something there. We did not. And Wild Child sacrifices himself valiantly on behalf of Psylocke. Sinister, he does gather the genes of these Araco mutants to make it back to Krakoa and tells Quanan if she, if she gets bit back to Krakoa, he'll continue taking care of her package, which is the full extent of acknowledging fallen angels that should ever happen in any comics moving forward. So, Quanon, Greycrow, and Havoc, they do make it back through Otherworld to the Krakoan Gate that uh, will take them back to, you know, safety and, and resurrection protocols. So does uh, Empath, you know, separately. He goes his own way. He bails on that battle pretty quickly. But Greycrow, he does here get his revenge. Now, if you remember from the last issue, Empath had made Greycrow essentially his um, happy-go-lucky buddy by manipulating his emotions to love Empath, who's clearly getting tired of him. And Greycrow here gets his faculties back 
and uh, it stabs Empath in the gut, leaving him to crawl to the Krakone Gate while he's bleeding out, which was anticipated and expected. But less expected, although maybe we could have seen it coming, is that once the Hellions are back on Krakoa, Sinister, possibly the real Sinister, but is it ever, you know, like <laughs> they're all clones until proven otherwise, kills all the Hellions. So no one can recount that his gambit was purely to get Arako DNA. I mean, I guess he doesn't want that getting out of the bag, so it's yet another sinister secret that gets filed away that the council won't know about. So Quanon, Grey Crow, Havoc, and Empath could be resurrected. You know, they died on Krakoan land as opposed to an other world, likely with no knowledge of how they died. You know, presumably like they would not have been backed up because they were in other world and they were only on Krakoa for a few short seconds. Meanwhile, Nanny and Orphan Maker are out as is Wild Child as they died in other world. So so long as individuals who die in other world cannot be resurrected, I think those three these three teammates are out. So like the Hellions are going to have to have a fairly new roster going forward, which will be interesting. Um, I, I have to say like. As much as I was enjoying Nanny and Orphan Maker on the team, I suppose, Nanny in particular, you know that goofball egg was like a strange individual to have on that team. Uh, it's like replacing them Suicide Squad style with mutants who are definitely less well known. I, I'm pretty down with that, actually. I think it's going to make this series more interesting. So, I mean, I appreciate that Hellions remains true to its story even as this Ten of Swords event unfolds around it. You know, you could just read Hellions as its own thing, disconnected from the event at large, and not have your series terribly disrupted. I mean, obviously, you would need to know, like, the very basics. Okay, Krakoa versus Rocco, they're doing a tournament to decide the fate of the nation. You got it. And, I mean, that doesn't feel true for any other book in this event. You know, I think every other book as a chapter of the event is integrated uh, very wholly into the event. You know, it does read generally more like, uh, you know, 22 chapters of the same story. Hellions kind of gets outside that by doing its own thing, by playing, you know, the sinister game. And I appreciate that about it. It, it actually makes the, the series more enjoyable for me. And again, like the comedic tone of Hellions, that's what the book is, right? It hasn't really pretended to be anything else. So I quite enjoyed that, you know, that's what we got in these two issues, as opposed to what I talked about in X-Force number 14, a series that is not known for its comedic tone and, and this event, you know, not necessarily known that until it turned into a, a farce more recently. So next up, the Krakoan reads a losing battle, which will take us to cable number six. But I mean, again, like it's it's not moving the needle on the event per se, but I do enjoy just Hellions as a book. Again, it's one of my favorite comics of 2020, not just favorite Marvel books, but like it's going to be one of my favorite books of the year. I'm enjoying it that much. I think Zeb Wells, Carmen Canero and team are doing uh, really, really excellent work on this title, so I'm happy to see that continue in the Ten of Swords event here. And of course, it sets up some really interesting developments for, you know, what Mr. Sinister is going to be doing, right? Like, he's got a lot of secrets and a lot of schemes going on, and uh, and this adds to it. So it'll be interesting to see what he can do with the Rocco DNA moving forward, assuming there is a moving forward, <laughs> which, of course, there will be uh, after the end of Ten of Swords. So thanks, everybody, for listening. Uh, I am Dave. You can find my stuff at comicbookherald.com. You can support the site over at patreon.com slash comicbookherald. Thanks, everybody, in the Mysterious Benefactors tier in particular for your generous support of, of the site and content and all the awesome uh, stuff that hopefully you enjoy. So you can find my stuff at Comic Book Herald. Like I mentioned, look for the best comics ever in my Marvelous Year podcast for more from me. In the meantime, next up, we got Cable Number 6 will be the next video I'm going to release here in Cracking Krakoa. That'll be Cracking Krakoa number 120. Let me know your thoughts on Hellions as a series on the Ten of Swords event and any theories or ideas about what Sinister is up to. I am definitely interested here in the comments. So thanks, everybody, for listening. And as always, enjoy the comics. <laughs>